Hello everyone, my name is Paul Rennie and I am the head of the British government's climate network here in the United States. And it's my great privilege and pleasure today uh, to be joined in conversation uh, by two of the people uh, who've made the new David Attenborough documentary, A Life on Our Planet, possible. Johnny Hughes, uh, producer and director from Silverback Films, Johnny, and Colin Butfield, who is the producer from the WWF. Right. Welcome to both of you. It's a great pleasure to have you join us today. And obviously, congratulations, because it's now an award-winning documentary that both of you have been involved in, which is richly deserved and, and fantastic news. And of course, I think we should start a little bit with both of you as individuals. You have phenomenal CVs, really incredible experience. And I can imagine that this isn't really so much a job or even a career, but, but more of a life's passion. And I just wondered if you'd like to say a bit about your own personal journey that's brought you to this stage. Maybe, Johnny, over to you. Thank you. Um, it was very nice to be here, so thanks for inviting us. Um, well, yeah, it's been quite a, a long and winding road in, in a sense. Um, I actually, um, I suppose that the root cause of, of all of my career was the very bit, the very man I've just been filming with, Sir David Attenborough. So I used to watch him when I was a child on the sofa with my parents, uh, religiously, like most people did, yeah. back in late 70s, early 80s. And um, as a result, I uh, went to university to study biological sciences and uh, I just wanted to do more of the sort of stuff that he uh, excited me about on the screen and uh, came out of that um, university experience um, with a great passion for the natural world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, came out of that experience at university with a great passion for the natural world and wanted to tell the stories um, that uh, David was telling me when I was younger. So um, I, I just always had the plan of getting into natural history filmmaking. It just took a while because it's hard to get in. So I went via teaching and I was teaching students uh, biology um, in the UK and a bit of journalism. And ultimately I ended up at the BBC, which is the kind of uh, nursery ground for all natural history filmmakers. Um, and uh, yeah, ended up after a, a few years of doing all sorts of programming at Silverback Films. Um, and that's where I still am, and that's, that's a place where we, we are trying to um, make certainly the best films out there on the, on the natural world, but also we've got uh, a lot of passion for the environmental message and telling the story of, of our planet and the uh, predicament it's in and how to get out of it. Brilliant. And Colin, your thoughts on, on your journey as well? Yeah, mine was similarly circuitous, uh, but I almost came at it exactly the opposite way around to, to, to Johnny, which is, I guess, also the story of how it, the environmental issues have changed a little bit. So um, I did a very typical thing. I was always in love with the natural world, always loved looking at nature, being really interested in, in wildlife, um, but thought I had to be sensible and go do a sensible job straight out of university, ma you know, management training course, big company, the whole works. Lasted about a year before I ran away and uh, volunteered on biodiversity projects around the world, literally counting animals, setting up experiments, that sort of thing, um, real baseline biodiversity stuff. Um, and then got into NGOs, working in lots of different conservation NGOs, but for the last uh, nearly 16 years now, WWF, World Wildlife Fund is its name in America. And um, in the process of doing that, it was, uh, lots of it was about things like climate slate, change legislation, and, and very much focused on legislation. Um, but sort of probably about six or seven years ago, really sort of struck me that actually, for all the great work that that felt like, that people like you, you do, um, that all of that, the one thing that was really missing at the moment was that mass public shared understanding of the journey that we're all on and that actually the route out of all this could actually be very positive for all of us and that's when I started working with the guys at Silverback Films um, we worked on Our Planet together uh, the Our Planet Netflix series in fact I was at the I think it must be the previous um, embassy because you're getting building works done or something but at the launch of that a couple of years ago we were there with with Sir David at an, at an embassy event there and uh, that then sort of built up and uh, ultimately has that project sort of concluded, I suppose, with uh, with this latest film with Sir David? No, it's fantastic. And yes, obviously the embassy has been a, a long time associated and collaborated with uh, Sir David over the years. And I mean, it feels when you watch the kind of film, it really does feel like the sort of bringing together of so many different talents, not least yourselves, but also with, with Sir David. I mean, what was the kind of genesis of the project? I mean, there, there are sort of so many demands on everybody's time. I mean, how did everybody get together to make a life on our planet possible? Um, 
Well, I mean, I suppose I'll kick on for this, Johnny. Jump, jump in, by all means. But um, I mean, one of the things was we've been just finishing off making Our Planet, um, which was a, not just a TV series, but um, Johnny and myself and, and a lot of other colleagues, um, including colleagues at, at WWF in US, um, worked on a series of, sh of sort of short films, online content around the series that really built that story out. And what we realised, one of the big challenges is trying to convey to people just how much change has happened in the last 60 or 70 years. You're talking about changing from one geological state, the sort of the Holocene or a stable state to an unstable state. And the fact that that change happens so quickly, but it's enormous. And it's a very hard thing to get across, very hard thing to comprehend this thing of big global change. And gradually in the course of some fairly informal conversations, a couple of, a couple of which over, over quite a bit of red wine, it dawned on people uh, that actually so many of these things had happened during David's lifetime. And sort of between Johnny, myself, Alistair Fothergill, Keith Scully at, at Silverback Films and David himself, that sort of realization of um, actually he's been a unique witness to all these changes and in particular with his professional life. So the original thesis was around the idea that David has seen more of the natural world than any human being who's ever lived and probably will ever live. Um, which is an incredible thought, but we realise we can't, we can't prove that, but it seems pretty right because it would have taken Darwin four or five years to get to the Galapagos. And um, David, obviously, his career um, went alongside air travel, so he got to see much more of the natural world and faster. But of course, since his career started, so much of the natural world's been lost. So there isn't the opportunity to replicate that, even if one had that sort of career and good fortune. So he's a unique witness. And it was Johnny that came up with the idea of, of it being a, a witness, a witness statement. And, and David really loved that approach. So I think that's how the genesis all sort of fitted together. Yeah, it was, it's just a happy accident, really, I, I guess. Um, I mean, it's interesting when you're applying um, the furrows of uh, what's the big story? Um, how do we need to tell this? How, how do we get the plight of our planet to a mass audience? And, and at Silverback, we do a lot of mass audience um, TV. Um, and in fact, the Natural History Big Landmark series that we do, they're one of the few factual programs um, that can reach the kind of drama size audiences, which is why broadcasters are, are so interested in them. Um, but an environmental story where there are big negatives to talk about, there's downers, um, you know, that's, you have to have a certain approach to uh, deliver that successfully to um, a mass audience. I suppose that was the big challenge with this, with this particular project. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, it's really fascinating when you watch the documentary because it's sort of like a history of all nature documentaries. I mean, as you're saying, Colin, you know, David is, Atom is kind of synonymous with nature documentaries and its kind of creation. And, I mean, when you're kind of looking at, I guess, some of the old footage and kind of some of the new, and I thought it's also very powerful seeing, you know, David Atom speaking directly to the camera rather than just the voiceover that he's often associated with. I mean, how do you see that the kind of relationship between the audience and the kind of the genre of nature documentaries have changed over the years, Johnny? I mean, you're right. Well, there's, I mean, there's a bigger audience than ever before, and um, it's popular in more nations than ever before and it's quite an interesting uh, fact that uh, natural history films um, are widely accepted warmly accepted by audiences in every nation really because certainly if you go global and you're talking about a global story um, everyone rightly feels some kind of ownership of it um, it's our natural world kind of thing so um, you've got that wonderful um, invitation to um, get in front of all of these people from different walks of life. Um, and what we're seeing, I suppose, is a huge shift in the, um, uh, the positions of people, the, the opinions of the people watching. So not so long ago, it was really not okay to um, start talking about issues that the environment was, um, uh, was, was having to deal with. Um, it was almost unfair to the audience because in a way, it was a blame uh, game. Uh, you, you made people feel guilty. And we didn't have the um, ability to go further and give them solid, good, um, uh, sort of sensible, coherent actions that they could do. So you're being a bit irresponsible in that, in that respect because you're making feel, people feel bad but not allowing them to respond to it. And I think what we're entering now, uh, and it's only quite recent, is... Um, a kind of new uh, ability within environmental films 
that you, 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 you have to explain the problems and the scale of the problems because there's still a lot of uh, misunderstanding out there. But alongside that, you can talk about genuine solutions um, and things that are, we already know about and that we can always, we, we, we're at the stage where we can start rolling them out at, at a large scale. So, um, you know, there is good news ahead and that wasn't the case until quite recently. And, and Colin, it's interesting. I, I was watching the film with my 10 year old daughter. So uh, all these little ticker tapes that kind of keep kicking up the planet's population and cutting back on how much wilderness, you know, she, she swung to my wife and I when it hit the 1970s and said it all got worse after that, didn't it, Dad? So it's kind of, I mean, what's your sense, Colin, of how, I guess, both the generations are changing and how they want to relate to nature. But I'm quite struck that a generation such as probably ours that was very aware of things like the hole in the ozone layer is, is now in positions of influence and uh, can change things in a way. And that's perhaps the first time that's happened in kind of the last, well, in human history, Colin. Yeah, I think that's correct. I think that aligned, that, that point which was absolutely spot on, aligned with the fact that we're finally in a position where you can genuinely talk globally. Everybody can communicate with each other by and large very, very quickly and understand the same facts and truth and conditions. Um, but also that, and I distinctly remember this shift in just the sort of couple of decades I've been working in conservation. We always used to talk about climate change or environmental issues for, for future generations, for our children's children and some abstract point in the future. Well, now you know, your, your, your daughter's 10, I've got a uh, 12 and a nine year old, they're gonna see this. Whatever happens, success or failure, we build a better world, they'll live in it, we mess it up, they're gonna inherit, they're gonna be in that, they are gonna see it. So I think there's been a fundamental shift that us lot now, our age group, that are in positions of influence, are every day looking at the people that are gonna inherit the outcomes of our actions. And that is fundamentally changing things, Not uh, not just amongst perhaps people that would you'd expect would care given the jobs they do, but also those in perhaps much more commercial organisations, much more other areas of of, of, of politics and uh, that 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 reality. I mean, and perhaps that's not not even just the communications thing. It's as we humans are good at dealing with short term problems when they're immediately in front of us. We've evolved that way. We're not so great at dealing with long term things that are some way off in the future, and that that goalpost has got ever closer. So now we've got both the close goalpost, but actually solutions we can activate. It feels like we've possibly got this extraordinary window of opportunity in the next few years to, to really do something about it. And, and I guess, I mean, Johnny, it's interesting for you, there must be a great burden on you as a filmmaker and a documentary in this, because again, you sort of look in the, in the film from the original you know, black and white images of pangolins emerging from the forest, and then you kind of switch to high resolution pictures of some of these incredible birds of paradise. I mean. As a documentary maker over the years, I guess the tools for you have changed, but also the, I guess, the urgency as well of how you tell the story. Yeah, I mean, actually, to be honest, my career relies on um, tools changing all the time because uh, things get better and better, better and better. Res, you know, we, how many times we film lions over the years? Many, 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 many times. But um, when the cameras keep improving, when our ability to capture, say, even slower motion or uh, heat maps or um, macro or, um, you know, nighttime filming, they, they, all that stuff keeps coming through. And it's astonishing um, the, the degree to which we can always find new things to show. Um, it's out there that, you know, that we think we know the natural world, but I mean, we think we do. <laughs> In, in the business, but we, you know, we don't. There's still so much to uh, discover. And I think another big revelation um, that certainly dawned on me and a lot of other, others in my position is that um, what we've seen of the natural world is a very strange state because actually human beings command this planet and um, we're talking about a, a natural world that, you know, it, the one that's familiar to us is not in its resting state. Um, and uh, it's, it's under the cosh. And where you find you know, biodiversity doing well, which is where we always take our cameras, of course, th those are now far and few between those places and they're completely surrounded by um, world, uh, world dominated by us. Um, so I'm not sure we've seen all of the natural behaviors in a sense, because we are forcing uh, species to live their lives in a different way. I mean, you look at uh, any migration these days is, you know, aerial or on the land is massively impacted by uh, their route being blocked or they have to alter it or, or they have to time it so that certain things uh, can be avoided. 
um, and virtually any predator because of it, the demand it has on, on its, in its territory um, is impacted by our presence. Um, so we're finding it, it is ex extraordinary how we can continually to d discover these, um, uh, th these behaviors that we never knew existed. I mean, I'll give you a really good example. Um, leopards, we, we could never film leopards. Back in the 70s and 80s, leopards are geniuses at hiding. And um, you, you could have people, Bushmen, you know, in the Kalahari, who knew exactly how many leopards lived around them. They knew the sex of the leopards, they knew if some were, pre were pregnant, but they had never seen them. They only knew that from the footprints and the, and the, the routines that they could describe in, in, the, in the land around them. And we had similar troubles trying to film them. We just couldn't get sight of them until the 90s. And then what you were finding is um, leopards that had spent their entire lives in a protected area and a well-protected area. Um, and they didn't uh, consider humans to be a, a threat like every other generation of, of leopard in recent history had done and so then all of a sudden you saw them coming out during the day and we filmed them and now you know filming leopards is certainly possible in all over the world in different parts of the world because uh, that same thing has happened so uh, it's an ever shifting scenario with the natural world and, and we we really haven't um seen it at its full kind of majesty at its at its uh, its full expression and it's interesting, Colin, because again, in the documentary, you kind of see this, this contrast between, you know, the early David Attenborough, with the sort of microphone in the water, listening for whale music, and then you sort of cut to this kind of beautiful whale songs and the kind of dance, I would say, in the oceans. And I mean, I guess, Colin, sort of speaking to you, I suppose that Johnny gives you the tools with which to create a, a more personal bond over the years with the animals and, and with the humanity's connection with nature. I mean, I suppose that then shifts the burden back to you as a as an activist to then make sure that message is, is kind of landing in terms of change. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, both in terms of the impacts on 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 nature, the um, obviously becoming better and better documented by by, by people like Silverbacks, like Johnny and, and, and his colleagues. Um, but also actually the whale example is a really interesting one because that gave us perhaps the most incredible tools we've ever had, which is whale numbers were declining. Everybody knows that the whaling was decimating the population. There were some, there were some horrible images, quite rightly horrible, of, um, of whales being hunted. Um, but actually, the, 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 the example you described from the film, where you see this huge aggregation of humpback whales off the coast of South Africa, um, was the largest that had ever been at least recorded, if not witnessed, as far as we're, we're aware, for hundreds of years. Um, so the sight that nature can recover, and, and, and often a lot of our job is to try and describe how if we give it space if we give it the opportunity nature can recover and in recovering um, greatly benefits all of us if you like that's the meta story we're trying to tell the whole time but it's often quite hard because that process of recovery is so slow and there's often not the evidence or not the visual evidence to tell it and bringing it to life through scientific papers isn't works for some not all um, so to have that kind of incredible visual image um, of showing what it looks like when the whales bounce back and then being able to explain what that means for the whole ocean cycle that we of course you know a billion people depend on on fish for their their income and protein it's not irrelevant to us they're not just nice things to watch um, and the, the sort of skills of the filmmakers at Silverback and, and others bring that gift to us to then describe well, just imagine what we could have um, just imagine how much better our world could actually be and that's a far more attractive sell than um, fear and, and and scariness you need the element of that reality check we can't pretend it's going to be fine but it's much more attractive to sell wouldn't you just like a world that was a bit more like that and giving the pictures to bring it to life is invaluable and, and it, but it's also interesting colin because when you when you watch the film it, it's a slightly darker documentary perhaps than you might have seen in and some of other of, of Sir David Attenborough's work. And, and it's interesting, Johnny's saying, it's always, I think, this constant tension between the, the sort of majesty of nature and the kind of challenge that we're having in terms of the humanity's impact on it. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if Ivy wanted to share a few thoughts as to why you think it was a slightly more personal, more sort of darker journey. I wouldn't say darker, but one that's perhaps more, you know, an emphasis on the reality of the situation we face. Was that something that Sir David personally wanted to do, something you discussed with him? I don't know, Colin and Johnny? Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it's very much something we discussed. I mean, when, um, when, when sort of Johnny had first had the idea of calling it a witness statement, it was that bit that actually really connected with David, because we've been talking about the idea of the film and all these things that had happened during his career. And he was really determined, because he's such a, he's a modest person anyway, but he, not to be 
portrayed as some expert who knew everything before everybody else did. He was decades ahead in his understanding of what was happening to the planet. Um, but once it was placed in the context that he had unique, his unique experiences had seen these things, he had witnessed them, then he could suddenly see how this film would work and how it would be an accurate representation of what he saw. So of course then you're in a position where he's reflecting backwards. And again, Johnny did a fantastic job of drawing, you know, sort of getting these stories to, to, to Sort of out from David in, in, in the way that it worked on the screen, but reflecting back on things he hadn't actually realized at the time. But of course, because of the career he had, all the evidence is there. So he then looks back at these images that are obviously now iconic and world famous um, and thinks, yeah, I, I actually didn't know what was going on at that point. I didn't appreciate how big it was. And of course, if David didn't, then the likelihood of many others is, 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 is understandable. So if you like, it is of course darker, but it's also a degree of get out clause. You know, up until recently, we, we knew we were doing some damage, but I don't think most people realized we were de fundamentally destabilizing the entire planet. And that's sort of the arc of realization that we all knew we were, things were a bit amiss. And then suddenly, as you saw in those ticker tapes, it's really the nineties where it started to really unravel um, and the last few decades. And then, and that, that's, of course, a much darker image because you're projecting where you can get to in the near future. And I think what was important, though, was, as Johnny was alluding to a, a, a few moments ago, that now we know there are solutions. We do have that arc out of it. I think if we would have been quite irresponsible to just leave viewers at about 60 minutes in. Um, I, have, I have a good friend, actually, there's a, he's the director of conservation at WWF, who, um, whose daughter had to go to bed at about 60 minutes in, and he had never seen the film before, so he had no idea what was coming next, and she left the room in a right bad mood with him. Um, that just, just, what have you baby boomers done to the, to the, to the planet? And she, she hadn't seen the, pre, the subsequent 25 minutes where there's a, there's a release. So it is a darker film for sure, but um, the, I, I think we... We hope we feel that there's, it's given the context and the solutions that can come out of it. The last third, um, hopefully, it's quite a realistic look at look at look at where we are today. Yeah, I mean, if I could say something on like that, I think I think you're right. It, um, the bad news right now is worse than ever. You know, we know we know way more uh, about how the planet operates than we did 20 years ago because um, of some brilliant work by um, planetary scientists and so people who look at the entire system. Um, but the good news is better than ever. So uh, there is a, is a really interesting, we, we, it, it's a sign, I suppose, that we're getting to this real kind of climax moment within our, our contemporary history, um, where uh, it's, it's a very real fact that we have to do something major right now to avoid a complete catastrophe and, and, and the collapse of the living world, which will lead to the collapse of everything that we rely on. So. Uh, the bad news is extremely bad. And I remember being in the edit and sitting with my editor. We were there for two weeks doing that really rough bit in the middle where we we're trying to, you know, put it in um, genuine context by, by almost dating it to the next person's lifetime. So we've seen David's lifetime and it was bad enough. But when you say, right, if you're born today, what's going to happen next? It's pretty miserable. And uh, yeah, we found those couple of weeks in the edit very difficult and, uh, you know, found it difficult to sleep at night because the truth is um, stark and uh, terrifying. And the only way you can dig that deep within the film and be fair to the audience is because you offset it with um, what is, it's not false hope, but it's, it's hopeful um, glimpses of the future. Because I think when we boil them all down, these solutions they are win-win. I mean, we, we've always thought of sustainability, I suspect, um, as a kind of sacrifice, something. It will require us to give up something. It'll re require us to have less of a perfect life than we do at the moment. Um, we, know that's, we, know, we know that's completely false now, that the sorts of things that we have to do to achieve a sustainable existence on Earth globally are really, really good for us and good for our children. Um, so across the board, the, the barriers to that change are gonna fall away. And um, obviously the audience watching this tonight um, are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds, but I would suggest that just look ahead, look at what is gonna happen because the mass global public is now understanding this story from, from watching our film, but lots of other reasons as well. Um, it's the story in their heads and they're starting to understand this story and they're the voters and consumers um, out there right now. They're also the people that are handing on their money to the next generation who have been brought up on this kind of story. And so the, the settings of, of, of people everywhere around the world 
are different. The, the story they understand of the earth and of human beings are different to the ones that we all experienced when we were brought up. And uh, let's prepare for that world where um, there are fewer barriers and there's far more motivation for change than we perhaps experienced when we were younger. And it's interesting, Johnny, because I realise, you know, we, we, we can't not talk about Sir David himself in this, in this project. And I realise it's not the first time that you've collaborated with him. Uh, but I mean, if ever there was an individual you would say has forgotten more than I will ever know or we will ever know, it's somebody like Sir David. So, I mean, of the many documentaries he's made, I mean, how did you begin to then kind of work with him? I mean, what value do you bring to his kind of conversation to take this, this kind of film to life? Yeah, well, he's ever present. Like I say, I mean, he's, he was there since I was a kid. So way before I was in the industry, um, uh, he was a big figure. And then when I started working at the BBC, you'd suddenly hear his voice in the corridor sometime and, and uh, you'd kind of try not to rush out and have a look. Um, so he's always been this kind of, you know, superstar, superhero, really. Um, and very much defined what a natural history film should be, um, not just in the UK, but abroad as well. Um, and I first started working with him in that sort of um, glance way, um, doing work as a, as a junior on, on some of the big series at the BBC. And then I managed to produce two shows for him um, at Silverback in uh, 2012, we started, uh, which was great because then I was working with him on the script, etc. So it's much more close. And um, then, yeah, I mean, again, the, the, the planets have just kind of aligned and um, just been around at the right moment to work with him on this, which is, I mean, I can't really imagine anything more um, a privilege, any, any greater than that, really, to be involved in this film, which is essentially a big legacy piece for him. Um, and I think that's, you know, to answer your earlier question, I think that's partly why it is darker than ever, because it is a sum up of a lot of thoughts in his head. And, um, and we're in a rough place at the moment. But... Um, yeah, massively privileged. It's also a huge responsibility, of course, to be involved with that. But um, he was always very um, welcoming and very uh, energised to do this right. So it didn't feel like a burden. It felt like uh, something that we were we were going to deliver throughout. And Colin, of course, I mean, I, I wouldn't ask if Sir David's on your speed dial or, or perhaps if you were the one who brought Sir David to Instagram to break all these records, which just goes to show that what a 94-year-old can achieve in the modern world. But, I mean, obviously, Sir David's not just an, an amazing presence in the documentary world, but obviously just his, his passion and activism must be ever-present for you as well in your world, Colin. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So um, he was one of the first people involved in WWF, so over 55 years ago. Um, so to put that into context, almost... Um, my entire career, he's been the leading figure in the organization that, um, that I work for. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so uh, to get to this sort of point where you're suddenly working really, really closely, um, particularly, you know, starting on the Our Planet project, but particularly over this one, um, we'd often spoken quite a lot in, in terms of things he'd be doing. If he's speaking at a UN conference or something like that, he'd, he'd sort of phone and check in with WWF and we'd chat through a few things. Um, but on this, of course, yeah, it was. He was um, calling Johnny or I regularly. I mean, it was we were, we were, the ideas coming backwards and forwards. And it was, a, you know, there were some extraordinary moments where, especially because he, I mean, I'm sure Johnny would agree, he's, when you're actually working hand right there with him he doesn't there's no prima donna at all there's no separation from him or anybody else on the crew um so you forget for a few seconds and then all of a sudden he sort of looks at the camera and delivers this whole big thought you've all been chatting about for 15 minutes and he sums it up in 10 words and it's just perfect yes that's why he's who he is that's, that's why he's amazing and you sort of that, that moment of stretching from normal to oh god yeah i'm in the presence of greatness um and that's that's quite um that, that's quite a special privilege yeah i, I mean it's, it's incredible because for me watching the documentary for a man of 94 years old he, he moves so sprightly around the screen and then there's kind of discussions of what's going on and and it's interesting colin wants to pick up on that on that un point because of course, during the documentary, there, there's you know, several scenes where he's speaking to various uh, climate conferences and there's that kind of very powerful moment where the audience in, in the kind of UN building is watching some of the things, the walruses falling from the cliff uh, yeah. because they've been unable to find you know, pack ice where they would normally go to rest. And I guess I wanted to ask both of you, I mean, you've had such a long history of working with documentaries, but 
in a life on our planet where there are things that you found you know very personally moving and, and, and resolutions you might have made yourself about things you wanted to do differently personally maybe johnny to you oh yeah i mean just being involved in the last few years not only this project but the our planet project before it i mean um, it definitely makes you look at your own life and what you can do um to make a difference and uh so um i've given up meat uh, quite a few years ago because that's a, a, an easy swift change that you can make um again feels like a sacrifice at first um, i love my bacon butties but um you know within the space of a couple of months that's your normal and honestly you don't miss it at all you really don't um and i pretty much think that's the case with most of these bad habits we've got into um that it, you know it breaking a habit does require willpower so that's that's our issue um but once you've done it it becomes whatever follows next becomes normal very very quickly um so i guess i've been you know what have i learned well i've i've, I've learned there's all sorts of ways in which we can improve things um and and reduce our impact individually um but also they're much less painful than you might imagine they're going to be so uh, that gives me hope that you know once people start realizing this that uh, we can make changes quite swiftly, which is what we need to do. And Colin, the, the changes you've made or the impact this, this kind of new, new film has had on you? Yeah, I mean, the point of impact actually was, was the one you, you referenced. It was actually at the, the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we'd decided to, uh, we'd asked David if he'd go there, and it was the first showing of any of the clips from our planet, and we'd created them into a special kind of, uh, David was live narrating it effectively and introducing bits. And although all of us had seen that walrus clip before and been incredibly shocked by it, and especially obviously the people that filmed it, um, but when, that was the first time it had been shown in public. And we're in an audience, I'm, I'm sitting in the audience, Johnny's in the audience, um, there's people like Christine Lagarde right in front of us, there are world leaders left, right and centre, and um, they all of a sudden everybody's, everybody's crying and gasping, and you suddenly realise just the extraordinary power of it and you know almost a moment of guilt of what we've we done to these people um but then the realization that these stories connect to everybody if, if they're told in to that degree of effectiveness um and these changes affect everybody and that really swept over me in that moment that realization that um that, of, of how powerful it is so um so obviously i mean in my personal life I've made sort of very similar changes to what johnny would describe stopping me just being very conscious of, of, of my personal impact, but more professionally, it's um, knowing we've hit a, a sweet spot of importance here. There's millions of things that people need to do around the world, but particularly this sort of collaboration between us um, and this group of people that have worked on it is something I want to spend, you know, the, the important decade we now all face working on as much as possible. So that's probably the biggest resolution actually is um, we've got a job to do that we're to sort of stumbled into, to be honest, but we need to keep doing it. And, and I guess obviously sort of going from the individual to, to the industry, I mean, you know, call, uh, kind of Johnny thinking about the film industry, I mean, I guess every industry is also trying to change and become more activist and a better supporter of the environment. I guess as a documentary filmmaker in nature, it's already in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind. But do you think the wider industry you see is also trying to make shifts and change to, to work better with the nature and climate? Oh yeah, I think everyone's finding, I mean, whatever industry you're in, I, f I think that, that they're discovering clever, simple, no-brainer kind of ways in, in, uh, by which to get more sustainable. Um, and we'll see more and more of these. And actually that's going to be the, the really fascinating, exciting news as we go forward. Um, uh, these kind of um, mind, just mind-blowingly simple solutions um, things that we're doing just slightly wrong at the moment and we could just slightly write them and i think there's a big talk about learning um the learning experience i think what's much more clear to me now is that by and large there's no baddies out there none of us are evil you know those people are sitting in the world economic forum very powerful people um none of them want what's happening to happen that, that that's not the case and uh, all we the state we're at now is just um, our normal is askew and it doesn't work with our planet <laughs> and and we're now realizing that so we've got to change our normal and yeah that's a challenge but you know it shouldn't be the threat i think that we have to date thought it to be it, it it actually is an opportunity more than anything um we've 
it's it's quite an important in, in, a, important addition really to the film as um, David and I uh, co-wrote a book as well to go along with it and in that we were able to put in much more detail than we could do in the film and um, and we called the last bit the great opportunity because that's where we're at now um, it's an opportunity for business people it's an opportunity for politicians for societies for families for individuals to um, grasp and the, the rewards of heading down that path and, and, and helping human race to kind of rethink it, it, its design for life, it's um, uh, the way in which we live on earth, that's gonna be tremendously powerful over the next couple of decades. So I think we'll get a lot of energy from it. Once we, once we get over the, the, the hurdle of feeling um, it as a threat, um, it should just become more and more energizing. And, and Colin, I mean, I guess, you know, to some extent, it can feel overwhelming for people, you know, the, the scale of the challenge, the kind of scale of, of the destruction and the problems that face them. I mean, how do you think the WWF helps to take this kind of massive problem and, and both kind of break it down for individuals to get their head around to make change, but also then to help those individuals influence governments and businesses and, and other actors to make the change on behalf of everyone? What's been an extraordinary privilege of working at WWF, what's great to see is that Obviously, this is a big global problem, global challenge, and many of the solutions are all of us acting individually, but aggregating globally. With an organization like WWF that works in 100 countries around the world, you get that real sense of what are the changes that are happening in the tropical forests, in the coral reefs, in the grasslands of East Africa, in the cities of uh, the expanding mega cities of Asia or, or, or Europe. Uh, you know, th those real sense of the different changes, but you also get that sense of um, the similarities. That, um, and I think that's what's been really interesting working at WWF and has shown sort of how those connections work, is many people ultimately want the same thing. They want stability, they want clean air, they want reliable food, they want a stable future for their kids, they want you know, a safe and enjoyable world, they want connections with nature. So those things are very similar. Um, and then, but what people feel powerless, as you say sometimes, if you can make the connection that shows that this whole shift is happening in many countries, in many people across entire generations, but also what I think WWF is quite uniquely placed to do is to take that into a business audience and a government audience in a credible and constructive way, you can build that picture of this is what a lot of people really want and actually this is the kind of change that could happen. And I think WWF were uniquely placed to sort of speak at high levels of government and people trust us to be challenging, but scientifically credible, um, work with business. We're not, uh, we're not against business in any way, shape or form. We know that's a big part of the solution and to reach a mass public audience. And I think aggregating those three things together across the globe is, is again, an extraordinarily privileged position to work in and, and, a, and a part of the solution. And a final question to both of you. I mean, obviously this documentary is, is phenomenal and I hope it is viewed by as many people as can, can see it. And I guess the question is, what impact do you hope this documentary will have? And, and do you remain an optimist on our humanity and our, and our plight in the natural world? Uh, Johnny first, then, then Colin. Well, that's good because I can steal uh, the phrase that we've come up with. <laughs> so, I mean, our whole ambition um, is to make green normal. We want people... You know, you ask an audience right now, and I've done it actually on talks and things, uh, put your hand up if you describe yourself as green. And even people who are coming along to, you know, a talk, knowing that it's by a natural history filmmaker, you'd get about a third of the audience putting their hand up. And there seems to be some uh, resistance you know, about people describing themselves as green because they, they associate it with being, I don't know, left or being um, uh, niche in some way or having to live a certain kind of life. But... Um, what we want to do in our storytelling and all the things that we want to do, as Colin says, we, we, we want to busy ourselves in this kind of world for the next 10 years because it's critical. Um, it's a critical decade. Um, we just want the word green to become completely normal. And it's so, so much so that you don't even use it to describe yourself because it's just, it's a standard setup uh, and everyone would be that way. Everyone in 30 years time should be brought up thinking, well, of course, my impact on the planet has got to be proportionate. Um, it, it's, there's no alternative to a sustainable future, really. So um, that's the sort of thing we want to do, normalise green and reaching a mass audience um, and telling them this kind of story is, is, a, is a good step to doing that. Mm -hmm.
And and to answer to the second part of your question, because Johnny's already answered the first <laughs> exactly as I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have wanted to do it, probably better, um, is um, it definitely remain an optimist because uh, I mean, firstly, I don't think you can do this if you're not an optimist. Um, but secondly, because I mean, time and time again, you see how smart people are, how incredible inventions we do. The, if we put our mind to it, we can achieve incredible things. Um, and the more we've dug into the stories around this and really kind of interrogated, are these solutions pie in the sky or is it actually a good chance for this you know we're journalistically interrogating if it's possible um the more i believe it's fundamentally possible to to stabilize things it's not gonna be an easy ride it means huge change but it is fundamentally possible if we put the greatest minds of our generation onto it we really move it we'll as johnny said start to find out actually there's a lot of gains to be had there's a load of positives and that will just flywheel will spin and um so yeah remain an optimist i mean i'm not naive about how little time we've got but um yeah, definitely. It's possible. It's more than possible. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Alex. It's the right, I think the right note to end on is realism with optimism. And just finally, say a huge thank you again uh, from myself on behalf of, of the British Embassy and the British Network here in the US to uh, Johnny Hughes, the producer and director of Silverback Films, and uh, Colin Buckfield, the executive director from WWF, on the fantastic and award-winning documentary, A Life on Our Planet. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank, thank you. you.